associated with that. Hot topics for Illinois Energy in 2014, things to be thinking about as you read the paper, things to be looking for or uh, on the paper or on the internet. And then things to remember when it comes to energy for conversations moving forward. I try to make my slides very uh, non-busy slides. This is my one exception. This is a list of my members of the Energy Council. There's no reason to memorize this list. It's just to give you a sense that I represent the companies that transport, transmit, and generate energy or are involved in the energy portfolio, including this institution, and engineering firms and law firms um, and, and, uh, and uh, companies like that. And I represent everything from wind to solar to coal to nuclear to natural gas to crude oil and transmission and utilities and everything else in between. So I'm not only the and approach kind of guy to energy, I'm the agnostic approach to energy. We think, we'll think we'll need them all, and I don't love one more than the other. I think we're going to need them all moving forward. So I'm going to start this with where Illinois energy comes from today. So many people um, basically turn on their lights, put gas in their car, turn up their heat in a very cold winter, and don't even think about where that's coming from. So hopefully this will give you a sense of where it comes from. People, and I do this by the way that people use energy. People use energy for their electricity, their heat, and their fuel. So I'm going to walk it through from the consumer perspective. So from the consumer perspective, let's start with electricity. This is electricity generation in Illinois. So I'll walk through this very briefly. 49% uh, of our electricity generation in Illinois is nuclear energy, 43% is coal, 5% is renewable, and 3% is natural gas. A couple points on this. Illinois is the number one state in the country for nuclear energy. So for those trivia buffs who didn't know that, we've got something to impress people at a cocktail party. We don't glow in the dark at night, but we are the number one state for, for nuclear power. Um, coal is 43%. That was 48%. In 2008, so that's that's trending down a bit. Um, renewable energy at five sounds like a small number, but it was zero percent in 2003. So now it's five percent, only 11 years later, which is an amazing uh, uh, growth factor. And natural gas is three. And why that's important? So I show you the national pie here next to it. Is nationally, you'll see that coal is 37 percent, natural gas is 30 percent, nuclear is 20. So you can see that difference from our pie. Our, our power is so nuclear focused. And because we have nuclear and coal plants, we really haven't had the necessity to build natural gas facilities in Illinois yet. That might come later, but it hasn't happened yet. Um, and the other, uh, so hydro is 7% nationally. If, our, if the Illinois River, the Mississippi River ran a little bit more, we get hydro out of it. And people talking about getting hydro out of those rivers, but it hasn't happened yet. I think that's it on that slide. So heat, yes, we need a little bit of heat this winter. It's been an ugly winter. Um, and 80% of Illinoisans get their heat from natural gas, 15% from, sorry, 15% from electricity, 5% from propane or, or heating oil. Um, that is, compared to the national numbers, again, a little bit different. 50% uh, national is natural gas, 33% electricity. Uh, the good news about natural gas is it's all about the U.S. Uh, Five years ago when I started this Energy Council, we thought we'd be running out of natural gas. We thought we'd be importing it through LNG importing facilities um, from countries around the world like Iran or Russia. But as we all know, because of the hydraulic fracturing boom, we have so much natural gas, we're looking at exporting natural gas to LNG terminals. So the natural gas that we use to heat our homes is American, a little bit of Canadian. Transportation. Four ways generally we, we do transportation when it comes to vehicles as natural gas, biofuels, electricity, and crude oil. Most of it obviously is crude oil based. We obviously also ethanol. For ethanol, I think Illinois is number two state in the country uh, for ethanol production. Um, and so it's usually used as an oxygenate. 10% of our gas has, 10% uh, of our gas is ethanol that we buy at the pump. Natural gas is a growing uh, portfolio for transportation. Uh, I have a picture here of an Ozinga uh, cement truck in Chicago. Ozinga is got is going to have all their cement trucks on compressed natural gas by the year 2020 because it saves them. I think it's a dollar fifty equivalent per gallon for natural gas as it is to crude oil, diesel, or, or gasoline. So they're saving money every time they fill their trucks. Um, and electricity obviously is a growing way to transport, uh, but it's still a sliver compared to, to crude oil. And I'd be happy to talk about any one of those, but let's talk about 
crude oil for one minute. Where does it come from? It's my, one of my favorite slides. Again, 2008 when I started this, we were importing 60% of the petroleum we were using in this country. Six zero, 60%. 60 That's 2008. And now the pie is turned in five short years. Now, 60% of the petroleum is U.S. based. Um, obviously, again, that's because of the hydraulic fracturing boom. People think about hydraulic fracturing, they think about natural gas, but as most of you all know, that hydraulic fracturing brings up oil as well. Um, just a quick story on that. Has anybody here been to North Dakota, Western North Dakota, um, back there? I, I actually have not been there yet. I've talked to 100 people that have been, and they tell me stories. I'm sure you've got stories. But I just have a couple statistics about just North Dakota, which is now the number two state for oil production in the country next to Texas. Williston, North Dakota, the Bakken region, you'll hear about the Bakken region, was producing, I think it was 60,000 barrels of oil a day in 2005, and now they're producing a million barrels of oil a day. That's the difference. Now, of course, they have uh, lots of people working there. They need infrastructure issues. There's road issues. It's not all puppy dog tails and daisies up there, but there's a lot of people with a lot of jobs working hard to get oil to market. My brother went through there on his way to Montana for vacation last summer, met a couple in Williston, North Dakota, the this fastest growing small town in America, went from 17,000 people in 2005 to 45,000 people today. Imagine that. And then he met a couple there whose, whose nephew worked as a safety engineer on a rig in Western North Dakota making $1,800 a day. I'm not an engineer, but I kind of wish now that I became one. Um, now, the thing is, he's still in Western North Dakota, but it ain't bad. Of course, if you want to rent a home there, it's four or 5000 a month. You get a job there, you got to bring your own house. It is a good old-fashioned uh, uh, gold rush, basically. Um, but that's one of the reasons this has turned. In fact, this is another a reason why this has turned so much. I want to make sure we understood that. Um, but we still import oil. Where do we import oil from? People have a lot of misconceptions about that. So I call it the Elite Eight for importing oil. This is, uh, I think, based on uh, 2013 numbers. Um, I call this my vacation hotspots, Kuwait, Colombia, Nigeria, Iran. Uh, I actually, all those four, I'd probably choose Colombia. I've heard it's beautiful. Um, so, but they're only in the 7 to 4 percent of our imported oil. Then the next three, Venezuela, Mexico, Saudi Arabia, 13 to 18 percent. And lastly, Canada. Canada is not only our number one source of imported oil, it's 33 percent. That was 21 percent five years ago, now it's 33 percent of our imported oil. So if they want to win the gold medal in hockey every four years, I'm okay with that. <laughs> I'm a hockey fan and everything, but I'm okay with that. Um, they bring most of the oil from the oil sands, which has its own issues. We all know. Most of you know about those issues. When you create get oil out of the oil sands, it uh, creates more uh, greenhouse gas emissions to get it out compared to other sources. But it's also a source from a reliable neighbor, our number one trading partner. One more fun fact to keep to yourself if you choose to, Illinois' trading relationship with Alberta is greater than Illinois' trading relationship with any other state in the country. Sands. We don't go to Western North Dakota, most of us, and get oil, but we buy gas every day. What goes into the price of a gallon of gasoline? Um, this is the, my favorite chart to show that. Crude oil uh, price, the price of crude oil is 71% of the cost of a gallon of gasoline at the pump. And the rest are things that can be affected locally. Refining costs, taxes, transportation. So I live in Chicago. I live in the city of Chicago, and every summer people say, here's the price of gas, and Chicago's got the highest gas prices in the country. And you're kind of trying to figure out why. Well, the why is, is refining costs are a little bit greater because in north, northeastern Illinois, we need boutique fuels in the summer because we don't have US EPA, we don't attain US EPA uh, parameters and clean, uh, clean air, so we have to have a different kind of fuel base, which costs more to make. Then we have taxes. In Chicago, the beautiful city of Chicago, every gallon of gas is taxed five times. Federal, state, state, county, city. Five taxing bodies for each gallon. And then transportation and re retailing, I can imagine that a, the 
property tax that someone pays for a uh, gas station in Champaign-Urbana might be a little different than the property tax they pay in Chicago. So all those things go into a gallon of gasoline. And the reason I bring this up is President Bush, President Obama, the next President of the United States has this much to do with the price of a gallon of gasoline. They have a little bit because there's some reserves in the politics, geopolitics, but generally it's the market and these things are going to the price of gasoline. So now we're going to what we're going to expect in 2014, the Illinois Energy Update. There's a lot to talk about. I'm going to bring a few things up that I think are the hot items. If I don't bring one up, you want to ask me a question about, I will do my best to, to talk about that. Um, checking my time here. Good, we're good. Um, fracking. I have fracking up there as Scrabble letters because until five years ago, no one knew what the word fracking was. You could use it and you would use it in a Scrabble game and people would have challenged you and you would have won. And it's a great bingo word to be able to play Scrabble. Um, but fracking has obviously, as I mentioned before, changed the face of how we do energy in the United States. And there's been a lot of backlash on that fracking as well. Um, in Illinois, let's tell the Illinois story about hydraulic fracturing. Um, they've been doing hydraulic fracturing in Illinois for 70 years. However, it's just vertical drilling and using water to frack. The new system, which is a vertical drill, a horizontal drill, and using high pressure water with chemicals and sand is relatively new. That's what created the boom. And that has not been done in Illinois yet. Now they're looking at the New Albany Shale, which is in southeastern Illinois. These are the counties where companies have done land leases to get the right to go on people's property and do some drilling to see if the New Albany Shale can produce oil or gas at an economical price. We just passed legislation this past May, uh, and the governor signed it, the toughest regulatory model for hydraulic fracturing in the country, that both sides agree that is the toughest in the country. And uh, now we're doing the rules with the Illinois Department of Natural Resources. Uh, democracy takes time sometimes, but you want a regulated environment that works, so we're working through that process. The DNR had their first draft rules out and they got 30,000 comments on those rules. I'm, I'm guessing of which 29,000 are people who just don't want hydraulic fracturing in the state. Uh, we can talk about that in more detail if you'd like to. We Obviously, the chamber believes that this can be done, that the product is needed. Oil and gas is needed in the marketplace. It can be done, with, uh, if you, it can be done environmentally safely in a regulated environment. And obviously, it will create jobs, but that's the third reason to do it. You had a question, sir? How come, uh, not? How, how come they're not on the list? So the question is, how come some counties aren't on this list of land leases? So this is all about geologists thinking they, they're smarter than anybody else. The New Albany Shale goes into Indiana, goes up to other parts of Illinois. This is what the geologists from the oil and gas companies think is the sweet spot for the best chance to get the product out economically. And although they only God knows if they're right or not, and soon we'll, we'll actually know because we'll do some test drilling probably later on this year and see what comes out of the ground. Follow-up question. So you're saying White County is not one of the counties? Do they think they're that sweet spot? Yes, the that is correct. This is according to the Illinois Oil and Gas Association. They do not know of any land leases in White County. There might be some, again, this is according to the Illinois Oil and Gas Association. This is the list they gave me. You're just talking about the new all the shit. That's correct. Because I mean, they've been doing multi-stage vertical frac jobs in what that Yep. That's my understanding as well. They've been doing they've been doing oil and gas drilling in Illinois for seventy years, but for some reason he did not mention White County. It's possible he was an heir, but that's that's this is this is the list he gave me. Um, this is the story for energy in Illinois this year. Whether you're pro, neutral, or against hydraulic fracturing, there's going to be a long regulatory process that's going to continue. Uh, we expect the rules out hopefully in the spring. Then we have to get permits in the summer, and then the, the test wells get done hopefully in the fall. And every step of the way, there's going to be people who don't want hydraulic fracturing trying to fight it every step of the way. To give you one sense of that, the story I like to tell, and I mentioned that, I think, this morning to somebody here. Um, in fact, I mentioned it to you. I got an email from somebody anonymously who didn't like my stance on hydraulic fracturing. And they said that 
radiated men that eat the flesh of radiated men underneath my portrait in their death houses. <laughs> I, I, I love the imagery, but don't like the outcome. Um, they said I would create, I, I would cause earthquakes that would belch radioactive froth in the blood of Americans. And I told my boss, I cause earthquakes, I should get a raise. Um, but th this is the fervency that's out there, and I'm not downplaying. This is something you want regulated. This is you, you do not want me fracking in anywhere in this country. I am not qualified to do it. And companies that are doing hydraulic fracturing around the country understand the value of regulation. And the and the main problem or the main discussion is what is that sweet spot? How how can you protect the environment and make sure that you have a workable uh, environment, economic environment? the people who are bringing oil and gas to market. Smart grid. Uh, you guys are in Ameren territory here. Um, I'm in ComEd territory. They passed a smart grid bill uh, last year, or two, a year and a half ago, and now they're investing in smart grid. Smart grid means 20 different things to 20 different people. Um, but ultimately, uh, we're excited about the smart grid technology. We see it as an infrastructure development discussion. The utilities are going to invest in a digital grid that will give them more information more quickly so they can actually have a more reliable grid, which we all rely on every day. The lights went out now. I could still talk to you, but it wouldn't be as exciting because I wouldn't have these pictures. Um, and the smart, they'll give you a smart meter outside your home or in your home. And from our perspective, that's the exciting part for the, for the business industry because we believe entrepreneurs are going to come in and code of customers, business customers, residential customers, and use the information off that smart meter to make sure you have an opportunity to use your electricity more wisely and save money. I'll give you two examples. One on the infrastructure side. Today with Ameren and ComEd, have a, there's a storm that goes through your area and all the power goes out in certain areas. They have no idea where it goes out unless you call them, which is a really inefficient system. Because if you're not home, they don't know what's out. They don't know where to send the, the trucks. They don't know. And of course, as you know, the trucks come from all over the country when the big storms come. We have people from Ohio, Indiana, Missouri coming in, and they have no idea where they're going. Because all they hear is that this area has a power out. When you have a smart meter and a smart grid system, they have what you like the NORAD system, where they have all these green lights. And when the lights start turning red, they know exactly where the power is out. They even text people and say, your power is out. We're on it. We're going to get you some information and we'll get it back on again. And they can send people directly to the source, do some, uh, some workarounds in the, in the digital grid, and hopefully make that power outage maybe an hour long instead of three days long. So the second piece is a smart meter. I'm excited about the smart meter because I can now figure out why I'm paying what I'm paying. I can look at the information probably on an app or on my computer and say, what am I, what am I paying right now? How much energy am I using? And how can I do that better? Who's got a DVR in their house today? For those on the web, we have people with DVRs in their house. Two DVRs equals one refrigerator in terms of electricity use. DVRs are always on. They're always talking to the mothership. They're always getting updates. If you turn it off, it takes 10 minutes to reboot. So you never do it. Those things suck up energy. And now you're going to find that out when you have a smart meter and say, why am I why am I using all the energy? Everything's off of my house. So then the companies will look at ways to build better DVRs that don't suck up energy. There's, and I, I talk about this a little bit in length, everybody, because efficiency and conservation is so critical to what we're going to be talking about in the energy going forward. I, that's what we can do to help the energy situation. The environmental community, the business community, the labor community, we don't agree on much, but we all agree that the better we use our electricity and energy, the better off. Electricity aggregation, this is the idea where communities pool the, uh, the uh, small business and uh, residential customers in their area, and they, they offer them to a, an alternative retail electricity supplier so they can go on the market and get a better, better cost in electricity. 80% of the electricity in Illinois today is not bought through Comet or Amherst, it's bought through alternative retail electricity suppliers. Here are the communities that do aggregation. I think the technical term is boatload. A boatload of communities do aggregation in this in this state. Um, it's over 600. And what does that mean? Generally, it means you get better pricing. There was a study that came out this week that since this started in 1999, this 
competitive marketplace for electricity that separated generation from, from, the, from the delivery. That companies and businesses and individuals have saved $37 billion from 1999 to 2013. That $37 billion that will be, that was not spent on electricity, it was saved or spent on something else because we were at a market situation. Coal, yes, we still have coal in the state, but I always talk about people, it's not just coal generation, which I mentioned is 43% of our generation is coal, but coal production has skyrocketed the last three years. Here's a map of all the coal, uh, working coal mines, surface mines, underground mines. To give you a perspective, coal production in Illinois is up 50% in the past three years. 85% of that is exported outside the state. That's exported down the river, it's exported in other states, exported to other countries. There is a market for coal. Future Gen. Future Gen 2.0 has been going on, I think, longer than the Beatles were in existence. Um, thank you for getting that joke, by the way. Um, the Beatles were a band back in the 60s. I remember that anyway. Um, Future Gen came up in the Bush administration. It's changed a bit, but now it is a pilot project in Maridocia, Illinois, that is supposed to look at a new way to create coal-generated power in a way that's easier to capture the carbon so you can sequester it underground. That's the simplest way to describe it. Whether it will break ground or not, we don't know. They're getting their fine, they got the government financing, they're working on the private financing. They, we should know this summer whether or not this actually happens or not. I don't, if they can't get the financing by this summer, it's going to be hard for them to keep this going as long as it has. I will give a shout out to Senator Durbin, who's been a leader in making sure this project is still on the books as long as it's been on the books. Generally, we're supportive of this project because it's looking at a new way of doing something, a uh, new way of looking at coal and getting capturing the coal and sequestering it. I have one other sequestration story. In Decatur, Illinois, there's been a project going on for three years now that's burying um, ADM's carbon from their ethanol plant underground, and they're burying a million metric tons of carbon underneath Decatur over three years, and they're two years into the project. So they have all the test monitoring facilities to see if they, if people talk about sequestration, it's putting carbon underneath our soil, usually four to 8,000 feet down, and having it basically, uh, they call it a saline aquifer, which sounds like water, but it's not. It's porous rock that it attaches to. And the geologist thinks it's going to be safe and it'll work perfectly, and that's what this pilot project is testing. It's the largest pilot project of its kind in the country right now to see if sequestration works. But I will, I will let, we warn you guys that even if it does work and it works technologically, it's still got to work economically and it's still got to work in a way that people don't mine carbon uh, underneath their homes and businesses and cities. That hasn't been tested yet. Wind. Fourth, we're the fourth largest, sorry, we, we produce the fourth largest amount of wind energy in the country, Illinois does. Generally because we've got good wind near good transmission lines. Um, and we expect that to grow um, as we go forward, but we're not an island. Some of the electricity, some of the renewable energy that's bought is bought from other states, but the wind uh, industry has been good for the state. And since I'm falling a little bit behind schedule, we can come back to wind if you'd like to uh, as the discussion moves forward. I want to talk about Argonne a bit. Argonne is in Lamont, Illinois. It's a national laboratory. Got a multi, I think it's a $150 million grant from the U.S. government. I think they're actually partnering with U of I. Is that correct? Oh, yeah, thank you. Um, and they're looking at the mother, the mother load, battery storage. If we can, if we could actually store energy better, that would be. I like to say the word cool. It would be awesome. Um, and if you and if you invent the way to do it, you'll be richer than Bill Gates. This is a game changer if we can figure this out. And that, not just for not just for wind or solar, for nuclear, for coal, anything. There is so much wasted energy and electricity out there. But if we stored it, it would be in a different ballpark. Um, they got a project which I love because of its simplicity. Remember Herman Cain, my favorite presidential candidate in 2012? He had the 999 plan, which disagree or agree, you'll love the simplicity of it. Well, Argonne got the 555 plan. Five times the energy density, one-fifth the cost in five years. It's one of my favorite government grants because you're going to know in five years 
whether they achieve what they were supposed to achieve or not. And they think they can do it. Energy infrastructure. This doesn't get here by uh, magic fairy dust or bewitched as a twinkler knows for those who are bewitched. Energy has to get to market some way. And I want to, we have a farmer here in the audience, we might have another one. I want to use this opportunity to thank the farmers of Illinois and across the country. They bear the burden for the energy infrastructure. The roads, the transmission lines, the pipelines, and the wind farms, and future, future solar farms all get built on generally farmland. And they make arrangements, either we make agreements whether it's forced or not. Sometimes it's forced, sometimes it's not. Believe me, any company that delivers energy, if there's a better way to do it, they do it. But right now, there's no other way to get energy to market except to cross the wide swath of, uh, of farmland we have across the country. It be a major issue. Um, this is my picture of the grid um, from FEMA. It's not to scale, because if it was, I'd probably get arrested. Um, it's one of the most amazing machines this country has that makes our lights turn on without us thinking about it. It needs to be upgraded. It needs to be to be improved, um, but it works really well right now. Um, this is the pipeline infrastructure in Illinois, and I want to spend a little time on this. This is a this is the pipelines, underground pipelines that deliver crude oil, crude oil finished products like gasoline or or natural gas. These are the business to business pipelines, not the pipelines that bring gas to your home. This is the stuff that delivers from business to business. So I tell people who don't like pipelines, they might want to move out of Illinois. It's like the railroads and roads, we got a boatload of pipelines. One example, underground storage, the Canadian oil that comes down from Alberta comes into Illinois. It's almost a million and a half barrels of oil a day come from Canada through underneath Illinois every day. To give you some perspective of that number, the controversial Keystone Pipeline that's west, that's supposed to go from Alberta down to Texas, is 800,000 barrels. So we've got almost, a, 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 let's say, a Keystone and a half already underground in Illinois every day. And there's more. Enbridge owns a lot of the pipelines. They're looking at expanding their pipelines in central Illinois. Again, moving the moving the oil, the growing amount of oil from Canada into markets, into Oklahoma, into southern Illinois and Ohio, and east. Oil finds a market. Rail transportation, unfortunately, this will become an issue. Well, unfortunately, it becomes an issue because of the tragedies that have happened and the explosions and the deaths in, in Quebec because as you move oil by rail, which is a growing way to do it, um, especially when there's no pipeline infrastructure, um, if you don't have the right equipment or if an accident happens, you can have dangerous situations. Um, so that will be an issue that people will be looking at very closely this year, uh, and, and as they should. I'm not against moving oil by rail, but we have to do it in a way that is safe as it goes through towns, because we are one accident away from uh, some, some bigger tragedies. We've been, we as a society have been a little bit lucky that most of this have happened in more rural areas, not near towns, but these trains come through come through towns. And it can happen safely, and it has happened safely, but we have to make sure it's done right. I don't want to sound alarmist, but you can do things better. So I talked about conservation and efficiency. Again, you're not going to move uh, oil by rail. You're not going to build a nuclear plant, I hope. Um, if you do, don't tell me about it. Um, but we can all work on conservation and energy. And again, that also is a job opportunity and an economic opportunity as well, and part of the solution. The one story I tell on this is when I started my energy council in 2008 with 10 core members, the big energy players, and I had my mission about what we're going to do and the issues that matter. On page three was conservation and efficiency. And I just happened to be there because of the way I just thought about it out loud and put it on paper. And every one of those companies said, that's the first thing you have to put on your mission. So I tell people, when companies who make money selling you something tell you to use less of it, take the hint. They know this is a key part of our energy portfolio, so we should all be looking at ways in our businesses and homes to be more efficient in our energy use. So I'm going to conclude this and then open up for discussion with things to remember when it comes to energy. I have a little fun with this to finish up. People, what do people want? This is what the American public wants. They want energy that's reliable, cheap, 
domestic, available, and no environmental footprints. The Americans are really impatient people. Uh, Carrie Fisher, who played Princess Leia in Star Wars, she actually wrote some great books as well. And one of the books she wrote that, in America, instant gratification takes too long. <laughs> and you know that's true, right? You're in a grocery store, you're third in line, like, open up another line. This is what Americans want. But there are no perfect energy solutions. And I deal with this all the time, people saying, I don't like solar, I don't like wind, I don't like uh, crude oil, I don't like hydraulic fracturing. And I'm like, but what do you do instead of that? And if you find those solutions, believe me, the market will take care of that. If you, if, you, if you find another way to transport our vehicles that doesn't need gas, we will not pull oil out of Canada because the gas will be, crude oil will be $10 a barrel. Crude oil is $10 a barrel, we're not pulling oil out of Canada. This is Meatloaf, the singer from the 70s and 80s. Bad Out of Hell album, if you remember that, I'm sorry. Um, two Out of Three Ain't Bad was one of his, his great songs. Um, and he reminds us that when it comes to energy independence, we're basically two-thirds of the way there. As you saw in my piece, when it comes to electricity, we're basically an American, North American source. When it comes to heat, we're an American source for heat. When it comes to transportation, we're not there yet, but we're getting there. And I would argue that it's also a, not just a U.S. independence, it's a North American independence from energy. So with you added the NAFTA countries, Canada and Mexico, into that chart about imported and exported oil, we're basically at about 75% of our oil is from NAFTA countries. So only 25% comes outside of NAFTA. That's not, energy, that's not energy independence, but it's, but it's getting there. But I want to end this with a geopolitical statement. There are some people who will tell you, if we become energy independent from Saudi Arabian oil and, and OPEC oil, we won't have to deal with those guys anymore. And I argue that, well, our allies still do. We're still part of NATO. We're part of the global community. We're not pulling our aircraft carriers from the Persian Gulf just because we're energy independent. That's my opinion, so I'll throw it out there. They're just not that into you. For the people who saw the movie, that's the scene from the movie. Um, I deal with energy all the time. All people care about is, do I have it? How much it costs? And I'm trying to get people to think about how it gets there, how it happens. You guys have been awake and attentive, and I appreciate that. But most people just care how much it costs and is it there. So I try to get people to think a little bit beyond the box, but most of the time they tell me they're just not that into it. It's complicated. If you don't like hydraulic fracturing, then we have to use something else. And something else is, doesn't work very well. And we have to get, if we don't, if we don't hydraulic fracture, we need to import gas from other places. Where is that? Iran, Russia. If there was an easy solution to this, guys, we'd do it. So when anybody says, I got the solution, unless they're creating battery storage, I don't think they have a solution. But that doesn't mean that we can't be positive because things change. Uh, newspapers turn into iPads. Uh, and my favorite philosopher, Yogi Berra, said it's tough to make predictions, especially about the future. So if anybody says, this is going to happen in three years, yeah, they might be right. Ten years, good luck. If you look ten years ago, we weren't thinking about hydraulic fracturing. Uh, wind was not even close to as efficient as it is today. The turbines that are coming out today are 30% more efficient than they were five years ago. Solar costs have just tumbled. Distributed generation, now people are talking about that, like it's going to happen quickly. Ten years ago, that was a, a, a pipe dream. Uh, so every energy has got it changes over time, and we can't predict how. But ultimately, I'm an optimist. The glass is half full. Uh, there's a lot of smart people in this room and outside looking for ways to do this better. One, because they want to help the world. Two, because they want to make some money. Nothing wrong with that at all. And when you find the solutions, you'll do both. So that is my overall talk, and I left a good 20 minutes here for Q&A and discussion. So thank you very much for your time. So what did I miss? What did I get wrong? Yes. You mentioned for coal or providing coal at 50 percent increase in five years, and I'm just curious how much of that Illinois coal you have to assess how much is being used within the country and how much is exported. So the question is, how much of the Illinois coal being exported is used internationally versus domestically? I don't have a number for that. I have a sense that most of it is international. I believe it's more than 50%. The key is, as both of you know, Illinois has a high sulfur coal. So if you use it in the U.S., you need more modern coal facilities. 
with scrubbers that can handle the high sulfur. And if you ship it to India, China, other places that don't have those uh, rules and regulations, it doesn't matter so much. Maybe yes, please. When we see coal plants that, that don't have scrubbers are choosing whether to put scrubbers in or, or close and sometimes they close. Do you get a sense, uh, you know, the economics of putting scrubbers into old plants? Um, so the question is, what are the economics of putting scrubbers into old plants and how do they make that decision? Um, I'll, I'll give you a sense of how that works and how I've seen it work with different plants that have closed. It's never one thing. You have a regulatory environment for coal that's ch for coal generation that's changing and continues to change in terms of regulated emissions, sulfur, NOx, SOx, mercury, lead, and then you have the same regulatory uncertainty for greenhouse gas emissions. For the for the regulated emissions, they've actually done a fantastic job of, of parts per billion per kilowatt uh, produced to really ramp down those, those uh, regulated emissions. The Prairie State Coal Plant in Washington County, the newest coal plant in North America, I mean, they have, it's like, it's way below federal standards on those regulated emissions. No coal plant has figured out how to capture carbon or lower carbon emissions. So as they look at the economics of a 50, 60 year old plant, what it costs to run, what they get per kilowatt hour, and then the regulations down the road, those are the things they look at. And some have said, you know what, it's not, it's not economical anymore. We have two coal plants in Chicago, Fisk and Crawford that closed in the past year. The mayor will take credit for closing the plants. The reality is natural gas prices drove down the price of electricity. It didn't make sense to keep fighting for the plants to stay open. And it didn't make economic sense for them to put the millions of dollars in to put the most modern equipment in those plants. So it is about the economics when it comes to that. Does that answer your question? Yes, sir. Uh, Illinois was an exporter of energy, I think, still. And is that increasing? Or? So the question is, Illinois was an exporter of energy, and is that still the case, and is that increasing? Uh, so when it comes to electricity, uh, we export 20 to 30 percent of our electricity generation is exported out of the state of Illinois currently. Um, how long that lasts depends on how long the coal and nuclear generation plants stay open. And I'm not going to make that prediction of when that's going to happen because that's a whole different panel. Um, but, but it's because of that huge base load we have, especially with the nuclear plants, that we export that much generation. Yes, sir. A couple questions. in Illinois in the future. And second is, uh, you, what's your thought in terms of perhaps some type of incentive like feed in tariffs and so forth will drive some of the other uh, you know, renewable types of uh, generation? So the question is twofold. Is one, what do I think about distributed generation in Illinois and how that can work? And two, is what kind of incentives we should have for de distributed generation or any renewables? What I feel about that. Did I get that right? Um, I got to say that for the webinar. So. Uh, distributed generation first. I, I'm bullish on distributed generation. It's not if; it's a matter of when. And actually, the folks at ComEd that I talk to think the same way. Now, some people think it's two years before it takes off. Other people think it's 20. It, it's not. Again, it's a, it's a matter of when. But ultimately, as the price of solar and even potentially micro wind and geothermal as they keep going down, and as the price of electricity will, will rise. It's pretty cheap right now, but it can't be this cheap for that long. You're going to see that sweet spot where people start investing into the distributed generation model. The key, the key issue with that is, how do you keep ComEd and Ameren's grid working when you have a distributed uh, 3, 5, 10, 15% of the energy is in a distributed market? Now remember, ComEd and Ameren, they just, they're the, they're the UPS of energy. They just deliver it, and they keep up the infrastructure to keep it going. And we pay into it on our bill. Now, if I'm paying 50% less on my bill because i got the solar panels on my roof, then that money's not going to keep the grid up, but I'm yet I'm still using the grid to put electricity on the grid. It's this spiral. But ComEd is the first to say that is a positive thing. We've got to figure out the business model that works and how we keep the grid going and distributed generation moving forward. Uh, on the incentive side, um, that is a uh, very complicated question. We generally are okay at the, ch the chamber's perspective. 
We understand the need for incentives um, on early adopters. Um, how long an early adoption lasts is something we talk about all the time. Production tax credit for wind comes up all the time. It's been there for 20 years, I think it has. If everyone correct me on that. And every other year in Congress, they talk about it. And that's the worst way to do it because it goes from zero to 100 percent, and it just makes the wind guys crazy because they don't know what the market's going to be. We've actually said the solar market and the solar industry is so mature now, and a couple years away from what we call grid parity, where they can match the cost of other other products, that they should get a uh, extension of the PTC and have it ramped down over three or four years so they got a predictable market ahead of them and a soft landing when that happens. But that's our perspective. Other people want it gone, other people want to keep it going forever. Um, so we know, every we're not naive, new technologies, future gen, need the government and incentives to boost it. The $60 million question is, how long does that have to last to keep that moving forward? Does that answer your question? Yes. I was just uh, curious about did the Commerce have an opinion on, uh, on taxing coal uh, or coal made the right uh, Actually, I don't know. Um, that hasn't come up before. We generally have, I mean, it's come up before a couple times in terms of um, oil. So I'm, I'm sorry? We're exporting a lot of coal. It seems like taxing that might be a positive. Oh, taxing the production. I mean, the, sorry, the coal, the coal mining. So I was thinking about, I was thinking of the equipment in the generation plan. So the question is, uh, we thought about an opinion on uh, excise tax or other tax on the coal coming out of the ground. Um, we have not been asked to do that. People have talked about it because of the increased production. The coal industry in itself obviously is against that for obvious reasons. Um, I would think we don't, we're not big fans of new taxes, um, but I'm not going to be knee-jerk and say never, um, but we have not, have never brought, we've not been asked to talk about that issue. It does come up when it comes to hydraulic fracturing because what comes out of the ground as part of the agreement is taxed, and it's taxed at a certain level for the first two years, and then it's taxed at a different level, a higher level beyond that, with the idea that the risk is being taken by the driller on whether on the drill, and if they're successful, they get two years of non-taxable success. Everything's still taxed, but a specific tax, and if they are successful, that that. Production usually lasts anywhere from 10 to 15 years out of that well, and then the whole the whole uh, state shares in that going forward. So you basically, if someone, it's like three to five million dollars per well for these guys to invest in, with no surety that they'll get a drop of anything out of that ground. So that might give you an example of what we, we talk about. That's a compromise. That's an example of the compromise. That was an example of the compromise. Exactly right. Some folks wanted to tax right away and still do. Now. As you can well imagine, in this state, which isn't the richest state in the country right now, we have, we have people coming to us and saying, where's the fracking money? What can we budget next year for fracking you know, revenue? And I want to spend it on this pet project. And we're like, we don't know what we're going to get out of the ground. I mean, just to follow up, we had a study on the number of jobs that could be created in southern Illinois if this took off or if this came, if a law was passed. I did that with Illinois State University. And the range was 1,000 jobs. 45,000 jobs over five years. And I went to the Tribune and they laughed at me. Right? And they said, what's that? I go, well, if you don't get any oil or gas out of the ground, we're not going to create any jobs. Even if you pass the law and get the rules in place, if they put a straw in there and nothing comes out, we're not going to have an industry here. But if it is, and, it, and they do well, and these drillers think they can, we could have up to 45,000 new jobs. So who knows? I'd love to, you know, again, that's Yogi Berra. But when that starts, coming out of the ground, for every dollar that comes out in tax revenue, you will have 15 people wanting that dollar. And I will, I will welcome that fight, because that means we have an industry that's working, that's producing jobs on oil and gas in the southern part of Illinois, environmentally safely through a regulated process. I would love to be in that position where we're fighting over money. It'll be, still, it'll be a tough fight. Yes, sir? Uh, we got a question from online, uh, which is, can you tell me the current thinking of whether or not it does now financially or otherwise benefit a farmland owner? land from a crop farm uh, to a wind farm? Uh, I, well, <laughs> uh, we have a farm in the audience. I'm going to be careful how I answer this. Um, that depends on the farm. I mean, ultimately, you have a choice. And, and you can correct me, sir, if I, I do this wrong. I am not a farmer. But you, are, you have options in a farm. You have so many acres. Uh, a, a wind turbine 
will get you, on average, about $10,000 a year per year, approximately, just to have a turbine on your property, which is about a quarter acre. Is that about right? I'm looking for people in the webinar. There's somebody in the audience who's a farmer here. We talked about this before the meeting today. Um, the farmer, in and of themselves, had to figure out 20 years. What am I? What am I going to get out of that land if I don't? If I farm it, and what can I get out of it as a turbine? And of course, the beef and aggravation, the farming, working around it. I'm sure farmers look at it in many different ways. Um, the way the wind industry looks at it, as they tell about it, is they'll ten thousand dollars a year for that quarter acre will get you more money than any legal crop. <laughs> so that's what they say. Um, so I kind of laughed at that too. So maybe other crops will become legal. It won't matter. But <laughs> but I have no idea what I'm talking about. I don't I don't farm that. Yes, sir. So when it comes to hydraulic fracturing, the question is, what are the technical issues we should be looking at, learning from other states, and what are the policy issues? Great question. Thank you for asking that, because we're not the first men on the moon here. As people talk about hydraulic fracturing and the evils and the good and the bad, you don't have to look very far to see what's been going on. And there are challenges with what's been going on, and there's been a lot of good with what's been going on. So on the technical side, the key point is focus on the, the wellhead, or as I call it, the straw that goes in the ground, and focus on the wastewater management. Those are the two ways that the biggest environmental issue with hydraulic fracturing, um, water use goes down the well with chemicals and sand, it fracks and comes back up in with the product. There is no groundwater or aquifers 7,000, 8,000 feet underground, and it doesn't migrate. Whatever's left behind doesn't migrate anywhere. Every geologist will tell you that. Bill Clinton said that. The former EPA director said that. And they're, and they're not you know, friends of industry. The issue is when you bring it back up the straw, big technical term, the straw, you have to make sure it doesn't leak along the way, because that is where the groundwater and water is. And that's where a lot of the regulatory issues are, are done. Cement casing, steel casing. That's the technical part you really got to focus on. And then when the product comes up to the surface, how you handle that product is critical. Because at that point, if you spill it, if you, know, if you have an, uh, uh, open pits that, that spill during a flood, that's a problem. So in Illinois, for example, on the, on the, the product that comes out, we have a closed loop regulation, the first of its kind in the country, where the, the oil and gas producer has to bring the product up, the oil, the water, everything up, and it can never see the light of day. It has to be closed tanks, and they have a pit in case there's an emergency, and that pit's got to be empty within seven days. So those are the two policy, technical issues. Policy-wise, it's all about taxes. It's all about what regulations are necessary on, on an ongoing basis, lessons learned. And then, um, like North Dakota, initially North Dakota didn't mind that these oil guys were burning off natural gas, flaring it, because they couldn't get it to market. And so they were flaring natural gas, a lot of it, into the air while the oil went to market. Well, guess what? Now they're changing the rules in North Dakota. Even the governor said, this is not, we can't be wasting this energy. So they're looking at ways, regulatory ways, to incentivize companies not to burn uh, the natural gas and to get it to market or use it locally. So this isn't a conversation that ends when you start the test wells, or you have, hopefully, a vibrant market. This is a conversation that keeps going as you keep doing it better. And I'll end this conversation on fracking with one other comment. Is the industry isn't sitting still either. They're looking at better ways to get this stuff out. They're looking at other things besides water to frack the, the shale. Um, I've heard uh, acid. I've heard um, diesel fuel. I mean, there's other ways to skin this. Water. It costs money. And from a conservation point of view, you don't want to use you want to, you want to use that what kind of water. Again, things change. I don't think hydraulic fraction five years from now will be the same as it is today. And we should be looking at that and regulations have to follow that along. Does that answer your question? Yes, good question. Thank you. Yes, sir. Where are you talk to the gas transmission pipeline people? Yes. Uh, we 
live natural gas? Any pipeline okay. people. We live six hundred feet away from two pipelines, been in the ground over fifty years. Yep. What's gonna happen? Are we gonna replace them? One of them can't be serviced, one of them is big enough, they can load the pig on, one of them they can't put the pig on the scale on the inside. Are we going to expect to see these pipelines replaced over the years? So the question is, um, the landowner here has a couple of pipelines on his property. Uh, they're 50 years old. Um, how do we, what, what's going to happen to them? What, some of you can service, they're big enough to put a smart pick through to make sure that they're, they're, they're not damaged. Other ones aren't. It, I always look for the economics. The economics are that every pipeline has a life. It's longer life than people think, and they can keep those pipelines going for a pretty long time. But at some point, they have to be either shut down or replaced. And it's all about the economics, what the market is for that product. Are there other ways to get it that's changed over the past 50 years? Um, that's the thing to look at. There's no one answer to that. But the things that people will look at um, in Minnesota, they're replacing a pipeline that's been there for 40 years. It's, it's cheaper to replace than to get a whole new route. And they have to replace it because it's 40, 50 years old. And they can tell through the smart pick technology that it's more prone to accidents, and accidents cost a lot of money, so obviously they don't want those. But other way, other times, they'll just shut it down. So each one will have their own economics and own decisions with that. But they usually are based on market and obviously safety. People think that companies like have a line item in their budget for leaks. Uh, they do not have that line item. I mean, Enbridge had a leak in Michigan and it's a running tab of over a billion dollars right now that has cost them. So that was not in their line item. I mean, they're a big company. I don't think you should feel sorry for them. But they don't, they do everything they possibly can to prevent pipeline leaks and accidents because it costs a lot of money. One last question. Paul, you have one question. Yeah, I like the last question. I don't know. Uh, pretty much all of the discussion is there that generation. Yep. Why? Yep. Um, what about conservation efficiency, uh, reduction of demand? Um, you did have one slide that showed somebody hopefully turning off the light, but lights are only a very small portion of the uh, potential savings right. from whether they be and all that stuff. So. Yeah, it's, 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 so the question is the thought on, I only had one slide on conservation, I didn't really have to talk a lot of detail about it. Um, it's more of a grassroots economic piece that it's harder to put on a slide. I mean, it basically, every one of us needs to, has to, find ways to use energy more efficiently. Um, I, I, know I, I know I said it during the conversation. All my members agree in that. The, the issue is, what do we do about it? In other words, how do I make you look at your home and spend the money to find ways to to put in the insulation, uh, use geothermal, whatever that might be. And there are incentive programs that exist in the state to do that, and we're supportive of those. Um, but there's no one slide that can show it, but I want to make sure you all understand that the Chamber of Commerce uh, is under, we, want, we need a more efficiency society, efficient society when it comes to our energy use. And we're becoming more energy efficient. We have made leaps and bounds, lighting, et cetera, but there's so much more to do. The example I will use is Walgreens, which is everywhere, has a store in Evanston that is testing all of its energy efficiency in one store, the zero energy store. Their goal is to have a store, a retail store, that generates more energy than it uses. They have geothermal, wind, solar, they have lighting panels, they've got, you know, the change during the day. That is where we've talked about it, we encourage it. Companies are going to find ways to do that, so they're going to learn all this, all these things from that one store, and then promulgate it throughout their, their all their stores across the country. And we're, I can't even tell you how excited I'm about that because we need that. We need businesses and other folks to step up. Every kilowatt we don't generate, we, we say we don't generate, and that solves a lot of problems. That's my best answer. Well, thank you, Tom. Thank you. And I'll, I'll